All right, what's up, nerds? Okay, thank you, first of all, for coming out and listening to me talk to you for the next 40 minutes ago. I don't know if you guys saw Justin's talk before this, but Justin, you are the most casually hilarious person I've ever met in my life. And I don't know if your memes got enough credit. So allow me to say it for everyone else that's thinking it. So uh, I'm going to try to jump right into this because I've been described as verbose, and I don't want to take up the rest of your day. So my name is John Dwyer, and I'm the head of research for IBM X-Force. If you're not familiar with uh, X-Force, we are the consulting arm of IBM security. So we offer defensive, offensive, and threat intelligence services. One of those defensive services is incident response, which is the team that I came up through uh, over the years. And now my job as the head of research is kind of two, two areas. One of is kind of like a DevOpsy role where I'm overseeing technolo technology developments to make sure all those services are operating as efficiently, as effectively as possible. The other side of it is to kind of highlight all the interesting findings in things that we've had over all these different engagements and make sure we're uh, sharing those with the community. Uh, I try to do a good job of releasing like, kind of tactical things on my social with be like detection opportunities or interesting findings on uh, malware just because we kind of want to be, you know, operating appropriately in the community, try to burn as much of the TTPs as possible. Uh, my background in, in a word is chaotic, I would say. Uh, <laughs> So I, I started out my professional career as a laborer, went through help desk. Actually, I don't know, Dugas, are you out there right now? He might have, my first boss ever who gave me a chance is actually in the audience today. I ran, I ran into him. Um, but I've, I've done a whole bunch of different things over, and I've gone up through IT and kind of pivoted into the security and then into research. And uh, at first it was kind of like, am I going to be too much of a generalist? And then... Over the years, it's kind of turned into like a slumdog millionaire situation where things would pop up. Like when proxy logon and proxy shell happened, and I was thinking back when I used to be an exchange admin, like, oh, I get that. I understand how CASs work, and I understand how they interface with IIS. So I've been all over the place. Um, I have up there <laughs> that my superpower is OK with being dumb, mostly for two reasons. Number one is that. I never think I should take myself too seriously. And you know, it's one of those, if you can't laugh at yourself, who can you laugh at situation? Number two, I try to bring this up as much as I can, is that I wouldn't call myself the most gifted person ever. Uh, and, and when I was in third grade, my third grade teacher told my mom that I was probably going to struggle in life because I had such a hard time learning. So that's always kind of stuck with me. And it always seemed like I had to work twice as hard to accomplish anything in my life. And that persisted throughout my career. Uh, great story. Those of you who know me, it's like, you're going to get a lot of tangential stories as we go through this. Um, the first time I got like a sysadmin job, I was like, I'm making it. Like, I'm doing the thing. And I was really proud of myself. Guys, I went to that first team meeting, and it was like, these dudes are talking a completely different language. I had no idea what anyone's saying. So I'm like feverishly taking notes about stuff that I'm going to have to look up after work because I don't understand. And it was embarrassing and it was like disheartening to go through that process. And that persisted as I went through every single evolution of my career. And then I, as I got older, I started to realize that if I'm continually putting myself in the position where I'm the dumbest person in the room, that means I'm choosing adversity. I'm choosing to grow rather than be complacent. And I look back on that now with hindsight being very old at this point. <laughs> and I'm very grateful for that time. But if you go out on Twitter or LinkedIn, like it just seems like everyone is crushing it. Like everyone's putting out amazing research and all these great tools. And it's really hard if you're just starting out to not slide into those negative thoughts about yourself or about your career. So I, I like to bring this up anytime I have a group of people, just in case there's someone out there who's just starting out or, or they have that imposter syndrome to say that, you know, you're not alone. We all kind of feel that way. And if you put the work in, you can accomplish some great things. With that said, let me, get, let me tell you about the, one of the coolest IRs that I've ever worked. Like I said, I came up through the IR team, and like 
if there's any responders in the crowd, everyone knows shiz goes down on a Friday, right? So people call on the Friday, a client calls in, like many other IR firms, we offer a hotline they call in to declare an incident. So they say, in one of our, one of our domains, we've been hit by a massive ransomware attack. And they're a pretty large retail organization nationwide, three main areas of their business, but they got shops all over the place. And at this point, I mean, this was the golden age of ransomware. It was like every three days we were getting one of these calls. So it was like, here's another one, here's another one. So they call in, they said about 200 systems, they're offline. They call in, they, you know, it was actually kind of cool, the AV vendor, they're not responders, but they did some analysis, found the domain admin account and, some, and an IP address, they blocked it. And they called in, they were like, hey, we just want to run past this. Is it cool? And we were like, no, dog, this ain't cool. <laughs> like, there's a lot that we need to scope, right? So part of being a good responder, if anyone's trying to get into the industry, is, you know, sometimes you got to save the client from themselves, right? So we talk about, you can't move forward right now. This hasn't obviously been scoped as well as it needs to be. We need to increase our visibility. The only tooling that they had right now was AV. So we go through the process of the IR. And like I said, we've been doing these a lot. <clears throat> so they said, all of our files have a .ryk. Immediately, we know that's React ransomware. And at the time, that was the hottest one. So we got that all the time. Also at that time, we understood that the Emotet, TrickBot, Empire, PS exec, ransomware, we knew that that was a thing. And we did that. I'm legitimately, I think I ran the stats on it. It was every three days for f seven months that we responded to a more than what we considered as a major ransomware incident it was more than 200 systems. So to put that like, this was happening a lot. <clears throat> One of the first things, pro tip, when you do an IR, always ask for security telemetry, always ask for it. There's gold in those AV logs. And while we're deploying our tech, we're collecting that data, that all takes time, but you can usually find something that's gonna point you in the right direction in those AV logs. This was yet another example. In fact, a couple weeks ago, we put out a research paper analyzing why are ransomware attacks happening faster than they did before, which was a cool topic. It took a lot of time. But one of the more interesting findings in that that I think got glossed over by the media was year over year, there is more evidence in security telemetry now before ransomware de was deployed than there was in 2019, the start of what we would call the golden age. So that means that people are A, investing in detection tech, and B, the detection tech is actually working better than it used to, and there's usually something in there that could prevent you from having a crisis. So, Make sure you're collecting that data. Make sure someone's looking at it, first of all. And then, if you're, if you're an IR person, make sure you collect that. The other point I want to point out here is you can see that the older AV alerts, responders are going to know what I'm talking about here. So older AV alerts show someone trying to dump LSAS, show COBOL strike, show meterpreter. Now, what is weird about our timeline here, and, and bear with me here, I'm not going to try to sell you anything, but why I think every organization should be interfacing with an IR team in some regard, an IR consulting team. If you think about this, IR firms, it doesn't have to be, again, it doesn't have to be X4, it's great if it is, but if it's not, no big deal, but IR firms are one of the only disciplines in cybersecurity where you can, can continually observe an adversary be successful, right? There's a lot of smart people in the MDR, MSSP, AVs, all these, they're putting out fantastic work, but it's in their best interest to start to stop the adversary before they're able to complete their objective. With IR, especially with ransomware, the detection point is typically the ransomware itself, right? So that means the adversary is able to go from initial access to impact, and IR teams are able to reconstruct that story, and they're in a unique position to say, what is anomalous and what is not from an adversary operations point of view. And we talk about strategically how we need to operate now and in security is moving out of indicator driven detection strategies and moving into how we know adversaries obtain their goals and objectives. So this bottom thing here is incredibly weird. 
because we know from doing all of these rare ransomware investigations that TrickBot should be the first piece of evidence. It should not be some other C2 framework that is generally associated with human-operated activity. So, like they say back home, that's wicked weird. We're continually bugging the client about this. Again, being an IR person, one of the best things you can do is protect the client from themselves, but understandably, they want to get operations up as soon as possible. We know how to do the TrickBot, Empire, PS Exec. We know how to do that investigation. We find all the domain admin accounts that were compromised, find all the lateral movement, find where they stole data, buttoned up, three days. We're still asking about this system, because it's only one system that's hanging out there that has this AV alert. That is the only thing. There's two AV alerts out of a sea of mess that we're bothering the client about. But they want to go ahead and go with recovery. So literally typing the report out, saying, with a big section that says, dude, you might be pop still. We're not going to sign off as this being a remediated incident. You really should look at this. The IT admin texts me. And he's like, oh, I got that system, dude. Do you want an image? Do you want EDR deployed? Or do you want us to run your tools on it? I say, yes, do it all, right? And immediately, what we find out is that the same system that had Meterpreter and Cobalt actually also had the earliest evidence of TrickBot. It also shows that TrickBot was introduced through a Meterpreter session. That's odd, right? We know how TrickBot goes, right? It's spam came in or downloaded through Emotet. That's incredibly awkward and weird to see that data point. The other thing that we see is that the user account that associated with those alerts is from a whole other domain. It's from the HQ domain. Well, HQ. None of these domain names are real, but you know what I mean. So it's from the, the root. So the HQ domain was the, the forest root of this domain. And it was 37 days before ransomware happened. So we have to expand scope, right? So we call HQ and we say, you know, Houston, we have a problem kind of deal. Like, we need to start ex 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 uh, expanding our visibility. And they're like, well, we didn't get ransomware. So like, we don't have a problem. I'm like, dog, you got a problem, right? Because <laughs> this, is, this is abnormal. But you know, they also didn't get ransomware, which was weird at the same time. So we're moving forward, expanding scope, trust the process, collect the data, look at the data. What do we find out is that there's cobalt strike within that infrastructure 96 days before ransomware. Now, TrickBot to Reuk on our research is the longest lifespan of all ransomware attacks. We've seen them persist up to three months at the max. 96 days is a behavioral anomaly based on how we know these attacks happen. So 96 days that they're in this environment, they have Cobalt Strike, then we find out that that account that was used to pivot to West is an enterprise admin. Weird, right? And then we ask even more that enterprise admin account, the security and IT teams have no idea who's associated with assumption the adversary created it. For us, you know, if you guys aren't Windows people, and, and if you get enterprise admin, you effectively own the entire forest, right? So you've owned the whole thing, but you didn't deploy ransomware in HQ, right? HQ is the largest domain within the entire environment. It's got the most critical systems. If you wanted to create leverage, why didn't you deploy ransomware within the HQ domain? Incredibly weird, right? None of this makes sense. Multi-domain ransomware attacks, I don't know if you guys know this, they, they do happen. They're not as, not as frequent, but they do happen. But typically it is a, you know, one domain gets popped, they'll get enterprise admin, and then they'll blast it out that same day to everyone. This was way different. There's the, uh, that event log up the top. As you see, that's the uh, Cobalt Strike beacon, likely an SMB beacon. If you guys aren't collecting, tangent again, that's uh, system event log 7045. If you guys aren't collecting that, building detections around that, write it down, put it in your system tomorrow 
start doing keyword searches on it. If I, if I was a detection person with no budget or if I was a responder and I can only do one thing, it would be to collect that log. It is that valuable. <clears throat> In 2020, we put out a paper about detection opportunities for adversaries. In 90% of all IRs that we work globally, we found evidence of the adversary in that log. And that's built upon how things like Meterpreter, Metasploit, Cobalt Strike, any one of them, Covenant, all those C2 frameworks, how they do things like privilege escalation or lateral movement. They all do things like by creating a new service, right? So fundamentally, it makes sense because it works, right? It's the same reason why people use scheduled tasks all the time, because it works. Collect that event log, build detections off of it. We're collecting our data, going through. Two weird observations happen next. First is that we're only finding evidence of the adversary within the server infrastructure. Nothing in the workstations, nothing in the DMZs. The only thing that we find activity was in Windows core and internal infrastructure, server infrastructure. So that's weird because we can't identify what did they, would they come in through HQ? Why can't we find them? Did they go to West, go to HQ and back? That's stupid, that doesn't make any sense. And the other thing we do is we get a Yara hit for m.exe. And it gets a Yara hit for Mimikatz. We pull that back. Now, on, this is on a domain controller, and on this domain controller was an AV, and it, it was a real AV. It's not like Bob's AV that you download off the internet. It's like something that's gonna, Mimikatz on disk, every AV is gonna hit that, right? Like that's baseline. We pull that back and the only thing that hits is our Yara signature. We run it through our sandbox. The only thing that hits is our Yara. We run it through our, all of our AVs that we have, nothing hits. Toss it over to the reverse engineers and we find out that it is a completely rewrote version of Mimikatz. In fact, the whole logon passwords module within Mimikatz is completely obfuscated and rewritten. And it extracts a Go binary and that, that's how it ex, the, gets the creds from Windows. Holy shit, right? Like that's way beyond the capabilities of most ransomware adversaries. Picking up the phone, I'm calling people and I'm like, we got something going on here, this doesn't make sense, we're gonna have to do round the clock monitoring on this one. The other thing we pull back is that sec URL, CHK file. Start looking at that, it's what's on the left here. We start digging through that data and we find out that it is a, RP, it's a custom backdoor that takes a lot of code from Power Runner. If you guys don't know what Power Runner is, it's a, uh, it's a tool that you can use to run PowerShell commands or scripts without running PowerShell.exe. You pipe it through, it does the .NET uh, calls directly, translate them, so you can just run regular PowerShell commandlets without invoking the binary. So it's a bypass mechanism. The other thing that we see is that it listens on RPCs, will accept any commands, execute them through a command terminal. On the bottom there, you see that function install. What that does is that that's its persistence mechanism, right? So that is creating a, a new shared service. So within Windows, there's two, well, there's four different types of services, but there's two main ones. There's standalone and there's shared process services. Now, it's not unheard of to see adversaries use shared process services as a persistence technique. It's very unheard of to see it from a ransomware operator, right? Because you have to custom craft a DLL, you gotta make sure it executes, but it's in a really good sneaky way because you have service host binary loading your pro, so it runs as a, as a library that's loaded by service host. And they also tuck it into net services as a service group which gives it unfettered network access. So they have some dev capability, which isn't something that we typically see amongst ransomware operators. It's usually rinse and repeat. There's not a lot of custom tooling. We start digging around on that golden, uh, that uh, domain controller, top right there, event log 44 or 4662. If you see that without, that is not a computer account name and the account name, write that one down. That's an evidence that that machine's been DC synced right, through Mimikatz. Problem is, is the associated user account is not from the HQ domain, it's from the East domain. So now we have a multi-domain hop going on to deploy ransomware, like 
Now that never happens, right? That, that this is the first ever, I've never seen it again. Looking around at more of the data, we can see that the adversary had created a golden ticket and taken advantage of the extra SID attribute. If you guys, uh, there's a fantastic article that Harmjoy wrote, it's called The Trust Apocalypse. He can explain it much better than I. So if you're interested, do that. All you need to know is within Active Directory, there is a attribute called the extra SID, and it was created is either to, whenever you're migrating content to a new domain or you're upgrading from like the functional level of 2008 to 2008 R2, something, either one of those, I can't remember. But what he discovered, and then Mimikatz implemented, is that if you own the child domain and you have the KRP TGT hash, you can append the enterprise admin account to your account and the parent domain will respect it. Effectively meaning that if you own a child domain, you can own the forest. That's a big deal, right? Because now I think that fundamentally changes what you think about trust boundaries in terms of Active Directory and what you should be doing from a pre prevention or detection point of view is that any child domain can take a parent's privileges and so on and so forth, right? In this case, it was the root domain, worst case scenario. So again, we need to expand scope. Call up the East domain, and they're like, well, we don't have a problem, we don't have any alerts, Our, we don't have AV, like AV's clean, I don't know what you're talking about. There's no new admin accounts created. We have, we have no idea what you mean, but you know, CEO's at, on the phone at this point, and they're like, do the thing. Deploy the tech, collect the artifacts, start analyzing the data. We find 100 days ago, 100 days before ransomware, that same custom Mimikatz variant is in the East domain. So 100 days, like that's a long time to wait on a ransomware attack, right? Too long. We start enumerating all the data and we find some really interesting things. Some of the coolest things that I have seen in my career. The stuff that didn't make sense, honestly, until we, you know, until we went all the way through it. Let me show you some of the stuff that we found. The first thing we find, again, Windows Event Log 7045, we see it hits on a detection creating a scheduled task. Now, weird thing about this that caught everyone's attention that is that this binary, which we thought to be malware, was calling a wave file. That's weird. Not unheard of, though. You know, a lot of the popular malware families will do things like, I'm calling, J I'm calling JavaScript through C script, but I'm going to call it in a text file or a picture file, right? But it's just an extension rename. We pull that back. I'm expecting to see this as some sort of portable executable. Look at the headers. No, nope, it's not there. Pull that WAV file back into our sandbox, and I'm like, I wonder open it up in media player and the thing plays music, like real music. And I'm like, am I about to get the most elaborate Rick roll of all time right now? <laughs> so this doesn't make any sense. We pull back the task list w.exe, shocker, it's not the Microsoft one. We have to do a, long, a lot of analysis on this. What? <clears throat> nothing hits in sandbox, nothing hits in AV, virus total, never heard of this thing before. No one knows anything about it. So what we discovered is that task list w.exe is a custom loader that will only load audio files. Within the audio file, using really packed steganography, is a DLL that gets loaded into memory. Not, not encoded in the header, in the audio data, is a DLL packed in steganography, right? Hopefully that lands how cool that is, right? So it extracts itself, launches a run DLL32 process, then executes a bunch of shell code, injects into that, goes out to an internet resource, downloads yet another DLL, then it does some anti-analysis checks. So it checks to make sure like all ADB isn't running, checks that it's not running in a virtual machine, checks that it's not running uh, with any other analysis tools or sandboxes. And when that, only when that happens, then it will load a cobalt strike beacon. <clears throat> I haven't really talked about this through this because I honestly just forgot. But 
this checked into its sixth set of C2 at this point. So we have, this is a brand new C2 infrastructure in East versus HQ versus three sets of C2 in West, which shows not only are we seeing some developer capability, obviously, with custom tooling, but they also have the resources to maintain and migrate C2 across various hosting sites across the globe. Again, we go through the process, right? Collect some more shiz. Get another detection for uh, file name, original file name mismatch. Check that one too if you guys have that. Renamed binaries, it's a great way to find evil. JavaWorkstation.exe was originally named x.exe, connecting out to uh, an IP, an uh, internet routable IP. The other thing that, if I recall correctly, the other thing that the analyst flagged was this in Windows Event Log 50, 5144, I believe. That's in the Windows Firewall fire, uh, Event Log, and that will log when a binary changes or makes an exception to the Windows Firewall. And in this case, javaws.exe was creating an exception to allow un inbound network connections from anywhere. So that got flagged. And then we go and we take a look at it. Again, nothing in the sandbox, nothing in AV, just blank. So we have to do some real analysis on it. And what we find out is that javaws.exe is not the real one. Um, but what it does is it extracts a DLL which then dumps all of this data into the Windows Media Player registry key. And all of that data is a bunch of shell code, which then extracts itself, runs in memory, creates a Windows Firewall rule for run DLL to make sure it does everything, creates a bunch of registry keys for PS exec so it doesn't get, if they're going to run like you know, PS exec, no one gets a prompt. Or if they're running at a system, it doesn't just hang there. And then once it all does that, then it will load a interpreter session with a brand new set of C2. Seven sets of C2 at this point. We're going on. Now, I, have, I should mention, at this point, we're a week and a half into the IR. There's no indication that the adversary is active. All these back doors are just hanging out. They check in. Nothing else, right? The only sign that someone has been there was a ransomware on the west coast. Headquarters, nothing. No activity. East, nothing. No activity. Although given the level of the tradecraft, we're monitoring this 24 by 7. Several days go by, and then we get a hit. So we get a hit on CertUtil going out to the internet, GitHub in this case, downloading a package. This was huge for us because it also showed us that an adversary was active. They came back for some reason. The other thing that it is, we were able to yoink their GitHub repo and download all their tooling so that we could proactively go out and find systems of interest that they might be pivoting to. <clears throat> now, hopefully you guys know what NGROC is. If you don't know what NGROC is, just think of it as tunneling software. In this case, they're tunneling RDP. Not, fan not all that fancy, we see that all the time. Ransomware operators alike. Now what was cool, which I thought was cool, and it showed that the adversary actually had some understanding of the environment, not only the environment they had, the operational security to understand how this help desk software, obviously it changed the name. If you go back and did a historical look to see what did this binary do, the legit one, I don't know why or the purpose of it, I think it facilitated something for the help desk. But it was regularly making connections over 3389 for internal resources. So if you're a SOC person and you saw helpdesk.exe make a connection over 3389, there's a likelihood you probably just let it go. Or it's already accepted or bypassed, like it's already whitelisted. So I thought that was pretty cool that they knew what that software is, what that software does, and then try to hide out. So since we have this, also eighth set of C2 at this point, Right, now we're working off of NGROC. Now that we have an active adversary, we try to find out where they came from, obviously, right? And then this happens, right? Keyword hit. Support 452. Old heads in the crowd know 
that that is bad news, right? Back in the day, there was an advanced Russian adversary. They went by Cobalt Group. And they used to attack SWIFT and ATM networks all the time. And they stole so much money. And one thing that they always did was create an account called Support45. I was actually shocked, because they've been so quiet. I was actually shocked that that detection was still running. They used to create a, an account called Support52 and add it to the hidden users list. This right here. Set, oh, Windows Event Logs 7045 again, guys. Hopefully this is landing. This registry key, if you're not monitoring for that, for like any command line interpreters that are modifying that registry key, you should. It's really good. There's very, very false positive rate, and the adversaries are doing that. What this key does, if you're not familiar, is if you go onto a workstation right in Windows, and it usually will either show you like a list of people you can log in as, it won't show you that support 452 isn't there. If you go to see users, you won't see support 452. So it's a hidden user registry key. You add it to that. You could basically have an account without a cursory view. No one would know that it's there. So what is going on here? That's weird that we would see this. Like immediately for me, from my background, doing this a long time, when I saw that, I was like blown away. I was, I was like, Cobalt Group, are you kidding me? What is going on right now? I haven't seen them in years. The other thing, obviously that workstation name is sus, but that IP address, according to the client, does not exist in their network. That's a, that was a hard no. Talking to the network engineers, they're like, we don't do 192, 168 anywhere because those are often the default for cons consumer grade devices. So we do everything on 172.16. So that can't happen. Clearly it happens, right? So the hunt is on. It's like, where, where did this log on come from? Because it came from somewhere. It had to come from somewhere. Like, you can't make that up. Well, technically you can, but that's a whole other talk. So the hunt is on. What do we find out is this company in the East shared an office building with another company. And within that office building, there was one security office. And within that security office, there was one badge printer. And what someone did was set up a bridge network that connected company A to company B so that the security office could share a badge printer. And so there was a fat pipe going right into our client's network that they had no idea. Now, obviously, we asked about it. Either no one wanted to fess up to it, which, you know, being a former IT person, I don't blame them. Or they left, or they forgot, or they didn't do it, or who knows. But we go back, we analyze those systems, we find homie's been hanging out there for 38, uh, over a year. Over a year, hanging out. If you're a ransomware person, homie, why are you burning all this great tooling to carry out a small ass ransomware attack? This is nuts. It makes no sense. We're calling everyone at this point because it, it, it's fascinating, right? So we call the client. Everyone's jazzed up because the whole team's on board. It's like, we're going to get access to this organization. We're going to find out how Mystery Hacker got in there. If this is Cobalt Group, that I'm gonna owe a lot of people a bottle of bourbon because I said there's no way it's Cobalt Group. Brief the other organization. They were very appreciative. Gave them our IOCs. Gets ready to spin up the engagement. Turns out that they have an agreement with another IR firm. Sad face. They're gonna engage with that IR firm, which I get. I mean, retainers are retainers. That IR firm wasn't gonna share data. So we ultimately have no idea, right? How they got, who, where it came from, how they got into that other organization, or any of the juicy details. It's just unfortunate, it was kind of hit of a dead end. And we're talking with that client, and what we find out is that the other company, this, this, these guys down here, they are an HVAC and control system company and they have government contracts across the nation to install HVAC and control system in government buildings. 
boom, right? Wild. Tin foil hats go on because we have no data, so we're just like speculating at this point. But like, who is this? And now it starts to make sense, right? So, but it still is like, why did ransomware at the end? All the other parts make sense, right? I'm hiding out in East, beachhead, that I have my advanced tooling, nothing's detecting it, we're good. I can always get back into government facilities through this pipe that only I know about. Why ransomware, right? I'm gonna tell you guys. Days later, we're doing, every time we do custom malware analysis, we create a bunch of YAR rules, and we're always monitoring stuff that's being uploaded to things like virus total reversing labs, and we get a hit for the Java and wave loaders as well as our custom Mimikatz. So we get on the phone, we're using all of our intel contacts, we're like, who knows about this, who knows about this, who knows about this? We find out, and you can Google this, I'm not big on saying other company names, but like, if you Google Wave Malware, you'll find the article that I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, we find out this other uh, firm who we have a really good relationship was just getting ready to release a report about Turla executing the same payloads to carry out government espionage activities across the Middle East and Europe. Not only was it the same tooling, we have a C2 overlap with the stuff that we had in our IR. Looking at the time frames, we see that it is the same days. So same days that we have activity of legit espionage going on from Turla, we have an overlap of infrastructure, an overlap in, in uh, tooling, and we have an overlap in time with our IR. What the fuck, right? So who, this turned into like a real whodunit, right? So we, no one, no one's gonna say Turla is doing ransomware as a, as a sponsor group. Like, they're legit enough that we're not, no one's saying that, I'm not saying that. They carry out legit espionage activities. We see overlaps from Cobalt Street and obviously Wizard Spider with the TrickBot. So, why do I bring this up, guys? Well, this is very relevant. And we need to be prepared as a community for this is we can see that the lines between nation state and cyber criminals are continuing to blur. Like this is a thing, and it is a legit thing. We can see that, and it's a two-way street, right? So in 2020, there were two Chinese nationals that were indicted by the Department of Justice because they were carrying out espionage activities on behalf of the Chinese government using Chinese tooling for financial gain. So like, harvesting criminals from the dark web or all these forums, say, hey, do this, we'll give you some money. Alternatively, what we see is that you can see this quote from Christopher Ray, is that, and the evidence is out there, you can Google this. We have cyber criminals that are, are uh, espionage analysts, people that are doing legit th things, maybe it, I don't know, something like Turla, that are carrying, moonlighting as cyber criminals at night for their own personal gain using the tooling that was developed by those nation states. And in fact, what timing? It's almost like I planned this. Yesterday we put out a paper detailing how the TrickBot group is systematically attacking Ukraine now. Now, if you guys have been tracking Ukraine over the years or any of the TrickBot malware, you'll know that TrickBot malware is specifically designed to not execute on systems where the Ukrainian language is detected. That has changed. So now we see that the TrickBot group is carrying out attacks suddenly now that the Russian government is attacking Ukraine. What a systematic shift in behaviors. This, we've never seen this before, ever. We all, like, take, take notice, right? I've had friends who I respect a ton, very smart people, and they've said ransomware is a problem for a soft target. And I think that's small thinking. Because this isn't the only case where we've seen custom tooling bypass your EDRs, bypass your, your AVs, do all the things, and people still get popped, right? So we need to take this away, do, do that stuff. Buy, buy the EDR, buy the, the log central, 
you know, get that threat hunt team, do those things. But we need to properly prepare for when those things fail, right? And attribution is gonna get harder as these lines continue to blur. But does it matter? Does attribution matter as much as it used to, right? If the, if the attack's gonna happen, all to, I mean, if you work for a company, do you really care who it did? Who did it? So we, need to, we, we should be starting to shift our mindset away from caring about too much, in my opinion, about who did it rather than how they did it, right? And that's where we go back. We're talking about value of data and why it's so important to do things in terms of analysis. Trusting the process in terms of saying, collect, I mean, analysts and, and security people all like, they say, collect all the things, let me, let me find the stuff, right? I'm not sure that's the right way to go about it. And in fact, we should be using security, op security and threat hunting and all these things that we're talking about, we should be using that to drive investment. And we should be having these conversations with our executives and we should not collectively forget the opportunity that is presented to us from ransomware. We may never have a chance to implement the stuff people have been talking about for 20 years. Getting rid of admin rights, right? Network segmentation. You guys seen the zero trust stuff? We've, all, we've been talking about this for years, but we've never had this opportunity. I'll tell you right now, there's not a CEO on earth that is not scared about ransomware. So we have to understand the opportunity to do the things that I'm talking about. You know, build those detections, really work with an IR team to fundamentally understand the goals and objectives of an adversary. And with that, I really think that we can make a change to how we do computing globally. So, I hope you guys liked it. It was a cool IR, and I can take any questions if you want or if you just want to chat, happy to, happy to do it. Thanks.